Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. Thank you for our time together. I'm Pastor Summerall, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise. And yes, we have at least one more weekend ahead. Prayerfully, they'll lift these extreme restrictions on church services. But at least for this weekend, we'll be looking forward to seeing you in Fortress 91. We'll be looking forward to seeing you in the drive-in services. You know, I, I told the congregation last Sunday in the drive-ins, and I think I did it on Saturday also, that the Great Commission does not take a suspension during this season. And the requirements that God places upon us as pastors to take care of the sheep do not stop in this season. If you wonder why we work so hard, it's because God holds us responsible for you, and we want to be good stewards with your lives. We, we want to be able to look at the master one day and say, we did our very best with what we had. So every day we get up and we go at it because you know what? Jesus died for you. You are valuable to Jesus. And so if we spend ourselves on your behalf, please understand, Jesus died for you. You are valuable in God's sight. And he has asked us to care for the flock. So understand our hard work. Understand why we spend ourselves on your behalf. Understand, please, it is a privilege to be able to serve you. We want to get into our scriptures this morning in Psalms 102, beginning with verse 1. This is the prayer of a person who is going through a hard time, like some of us right now. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. You know, sometimes we ask God, please, God, I need a quick answer. For my days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I, I forgot to eat my bread because of my loud groaning. My bones cling to my flesh. You know what that literally says in the New Living Translation? I am reduced to skin and bones because my heart is sick. I've lost my appetite because of my groaning. I'm reduced to skin and bones. Have you ever gone through so much trouble that you forgot to eat and you start losing weight? I forgot to eat my bread because of my loud groaning. My bones cling to my flesh. He said, I'm, I'm skin and bones. I've lost weight. I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. In other words, can't sleep. An owl is a nighttime animal. So I'm a nighttime person. I, when everybody else is sleeping, I'm awake. I'm like a lonely sparrow on a housetop. All the day, my enemies taunt me. Have you ever noticed that there are enemies that when you're not doing well, they, they love to make fun of you. you. You can always tell somebody when they're an enemy. They don't help you when you're down. They mock you when you're down. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I withered like grass. And some of you feel like that. The beautiful thing is, this man came and sang this before God. God, these are really hard days. These are days so hard I can't eat. These are days so hard I can't sleep. These are days when I feel alone, okay? So notice, notice some of these things, all right? You can't eat, you can't sleep, and you feel all alone, like a lonely sparrow. That's how some of you are feeling right now. But beloved, all this weekend, I'm going to teach you that God is with you again. <laughs> I've had so much fun in some of this, beloved. Teaching you that you're not alone in this. That God will help you. Teaching you that you're not alone in this. That God will provide. And now this weekend, I'll start on, you're not alone in all of this. God is with you. Father, what a privilege it is 
What a privilege to stand before your wonderful people, your great people, and tell them the greatness of their God. Tell them of your compassion and tell them of your love. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you make your presence so real in the lives of your people. Father, these feelings, these feelings of aloneness are real. And the only thing that can take that away, Lord, is your presence. Your presence to give them rest. Your presence to lift them and give them peace. Father, make your presence very real in the lives of your people. Father, for those that are at home right now and they're coughing and they feel terrible and their fever and their head hurts, Father, let your presence just come down. Let that pain leave their head. Let that fever dissipate in your presence. Quicken their bodies by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and let healing flow within their bodies. Father, in the name of Jesus, break the power of this thing in their life. Let healing flow. Jesus, your wounds were not wasted. Your wounds did not just bring out the blood of justification, the blood of cleansing, the blood of relationship. Your wounds, by your wounds, we have been healed. Those wounds were not wasted, Lord. Oh, let the revelation of what you did for them flow into their hearts. Father, the pain and the coughing and the fevers, they're so real. Make your wounds, make what you did for them even more real than the sickness of their body right now. And let healing flow. Let healing flow, Father. Oh, shabaka sileando obokosata. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, let healing flow into the bodies of your people. I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Our Old Testament passage today picks up in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors was power, and there was no one to comfort them. He said, now listen, this isn't fair. I saw wickedness in the place of judgment. And he said, I see power on the side of oppressors. And I thought the dead who were already dead were more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. He said, you know, it's a good thing for someone to never be born and to never see the evil deeds done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from man's envy of his neighbors. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. Now, again, remember, down at the end of the book, we begin to see that this had been a very discouraged man who had turned away from God. And so because he turned away from God, he lost a lot of, he had no godly motivation. Now, in the world, in the world, this is true. But among the people of God, we have God speaking to us and telling us to do things. So that is different. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person has no other, either son or brother. Yet there is no end to his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This is also vanity and an unhappy business. He said, I saw those without an heir. He said, why are they working so hard? Why are they striving after riches? Again, you see the frustration of his heart. Brothers and sisters, one of the things you should learn going through Ecclesiastes is how mogulo the human heart can get separated from God. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. Two can get more done than one. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie down, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Um, one of the things you have to learn is a trinity. Three people. Is stronger than two. This is why sometimes it's better to have three. <laughs> better was a poor and wise youth, poor and wise youth, than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. Ah, I know, maybe he's talking to himself a little bit. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he has been born poor. I saw all the living who move under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's palace. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this is vanity and striving after the wind. Again, he begins to speak of his own future. Chapter 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Guard your steps. Draw, to draw near to listen is better than to offer sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Ah, when you come to the house of God, draw near to listen. Now, Solomon had done some of the biggest offerings in the Jewish people's history, but he said to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Sometimes you need to go to church not to give. You need to go to church to listen. See, sometimes people get into giving because they think they're supporting God. God doesn't need your support, okay? We give as an act of worship. 
But, you know, people, when they get wealthy, they begin to think that, you know, God needs them. And so they offer the sacrifice of fools. He said, it's better to draw near and listen. Be not rash with your mouth. So there's a rash mouth. Let not your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Now, I love to pray, okay? I love to pray, but here is a great truth in prayer. I am not a person. Now, I, I will spend hours in prayer when there's a burden that comes upon me. But I am not a person who just brings lots of words to God and repeats myself over and over again. Now, if it takes me an hour to say everything that needs to be said to God in prayer, it'll take me an hour. If it takes me two hours to say everything that needs to be said to God in prayer, it'll take two hours. If it takes five minutes for me to say everything that needs to be said, it's five minutes. Now, I learned this from my grandpa. And this is one of the verses that my grandpa taught me. He said, let your words be few. You know, there's nothing worse than somebody who just comes into the presence of greatness and just shoots their mouth off. They're always talking and never listening. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who's too busy answering, who's too busy talking to you? Yeah, you just, you just get quiet. He said, when you come to the presence of God, draw near to listen. Don't draw near to talk. You see, that's, that's the forgotten part of prayer. People forget that when you come to pray, you don't come to do all the talking. You come for a conversation. You come to listen. He said, now, for dream, for as a dream comes with much business, so a fool's voice with many words. Now, there's two truths I want you to notice there. First, I want you to notice the cause of dreams. Overwork. Sometimes the reason you dream is because you need a break. Okay? And he said, in the same way that you've been overworking and then you have dreams, he said, a fool's voice always has many words. I like what another passage says. Every man seems wise when his mouth is closed. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it. Why? Because God has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. When you make a vow to God, you know, it, it's, it's not a sin not to make a vow to God. But when you do make a vow to God, a vow is nothing but a relationship promise. A vow is a relationship promise, okay? Just like you promise a friend, I'll meet you at Mall of Asia at 3 o'clock. It's very irritating to people when you don't keep those relationship promises. And God's made promises to you and he keeps them. So he looks at you and says, when you make a promise, when you make a vow to God, do not delay in paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should make a vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? This is a problem for unfulfilled vows. When people make vows and they don't fulfill them, it brings destruction to the work of your hands. Now, you, ha you have to understand this. God's not just... Let me put it to you this way. A vow brings immediate blessings. When you make a promise to God, God acts as if it's already been done. God, I'm going to sow this seed. God acts as if the seed is already sowed. Now, God is going to lift those blessings if you don't fulfill those vows. And things that have been created because of that vow will be lost. When dreams increase, words grow many. There is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For a high official is watched by a higher, and there are higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He said, now, don't be surprised. He said, now, listen, there's always somebody who's somebody's boss. He said, so when you see the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice, he said, don't be amazed. He said, that high official is being watched by somebody. And there's somebody even watching the watcher. 
and then the king's watching everybody. But this is a gain for a land in every way. A king committed to cultivated fields. He said, now, you want to know what makes a nation blessed? A king committed to the land prospering. Now, that's what, that, that is what will bring gain for a land. When a president, when a king is committed to the prosperity of a land, and notice the word committed, they're, they're not committed to just, well, how do I go through the next four years or six years? They're, they're committed to growing a nation. They're committed to causing there to be food on everybody's table. When, when you're committed to developing the economy in a, of a nation, that is a great blessing. Verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. All right, so people who love money, you're never going to be able to give them enough money. Now, th this is a great truth about salaries. This is a truth about the human heart. When it comes to paying people, if they love money, you can never give them enough. If they love wealth, they're never going to be satisfied with their income. See, when people find their satisfaction in God, it's not hard to keep them on payroll. But when people love money, they're never going to be satisfied with money. And when they love wealth, they'll never be satisfied with their income, with what you pay them. All right, truth, truth for human resource folks. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has the owner but to see them with his own eyes? He said, all right, when you... When you prosper, <laughs> prosperity brings consumption. Have you ever noticed that when you're doing well and you're making a lot of money, you've got a lot of relatives coming over to your house? You've got a lot of relatives asking for money? When goods increase prosperity, they increase those who eat them. Sleep, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. All right, here's a great secret to sleep. The sleep of the laborer is sweet. He's tired. He's worked hard all day. Now, let me give you a little secret. In this lockdown, some of you are having trouble sleeping at night because you're not doing enough in the daytime, okay? Sleep is, sweet is the sleep of the laborer. But, you know, people who just sit around and eat their last meal at 10 o'clock at night, and they eat like a pig. Oh, they lay there and their stomach hurts all night. Do you want to really sleep well? Work hard during the day. Uh, a pastor walked up to me one time, and he was always taking sleeping pills. And he said, do you want one? I said, I never take those things. He said, well, you're getting older now. Don't you have trouble sleeping? I said, I probably sleep more now that I'm older than I did when I was younger. I said, you know, when I was younger, I always said, when you wake up, you get up. And so four hours, I'm up. As I gotten older, I've learned to make myself lay in the bed and try to fall back to sleep again. But I said, you know what? I work hard. And when you work hard, you don't need something to help you sleep. Okay? Your body is tired. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer. There is a grievous evil I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. Hoarding. So that's an evil. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but has nothing in his hand, no inheritance. He said, now that's a hard thing. As he came from his mother's womb, so he shall go again. Naked he came, and he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away from his hand. Okay? Um, you hear me use the statement, you can't take it with you. When you die, everything stays here. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, he shall go. And what gain is there for him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days, he eats in darkness and much vexation, sickness and anger. Behold, I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat, drink, and find enjoyment in all the toil with one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Enjoy your work. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth 
possessions, and power, to enjoy them, to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is a gift of God. Now, God gives you wealth, God gives you possessions, and God gives you the power or the ability to enjoy them. He said, this is a gift of God. You know, have you ever met rich people who, um, forgive me, are miserable? They have wealth, they have possessions, but they have no ability to enjoy them. You should enjoy what you have. Verse 20. And he will not remember much the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. <laughs> you know, you're not busy looking backwards because you're busy enjoying today. Brothers and sisters, I like being around people like that. You don't remember all the hard stuff. You don't remember all the difficult stuff because God is keeping you occupied with the joy of your heart today. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity and a grievous evil. So there's two things that God must do. God must, one, provide the blessings And then God must provide ability to enjoy the blessings. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people that are like Solomon. They've got great blessings, but they have no ability to enjoy them. Now, part of that is their lifestyle, all right? If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many lives so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. <laughs> he said, you can have a hundred children and live a long life, but if you're not satisfied with life's good things, folks, you have to learn to be content. You need to learn to be content. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness his name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth. Yet his appetite is not satisfied. <laughs> he said, listen, everybody's working really hard to consume it. Verse 8. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? And what does a poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the king? Better in the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and striving after wind. Whoever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The words, the more words, the more vanity. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow? And who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. Bye.
Our New Testament passage today picks up in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want you to listen to the strength that Paul speaks with. He says, make room in your hearts for us. This is your decision. Your decision in response to leaders. See, if, if you don't open your heart to a leader, there's nothing a leader can do for you. You know, I've sat with people that at one time their hearts were open to me and I could help them. And then I've sat there and talked with them and realized their heart is no longer open. There is no room in their heart for me. Their hearts are closed. And you know, pretty much at that point, I back up because there's nothing I can do to help a person when there is no room in their heart for me as a leader. And the same is true with some of our young pastors. Now, now, beloved, I know some of them are young, but how are we going to build churches around the country if we don't keep training new pastors, training pastors and sending them out? So you, you have to also open your hearts to these young pastors. Will some of them make some mistakes? I'm sure. I think of all the mistakes I made as your pastor 40 years ago. Goodness gracious. But the people loved me and we grew together. Make room in your hearts for us. Now listen to what Paul says. Number one, he said, we have wronged no one. Number two, we have corrupted no one. And number three, we have taken advantage of no one. Now notice how strongly Paul says that. He said, you know, I, I know the things people are saying about me. I, I know how people are saying that, you know, I'm, maybe I didn't take anything from you, but uh, I deceived you by the use of Titus. He said, I, I know the things that people are saying about me. But he said, you know what? I also know my life. I have wronged no one. I have corrupted no one. I have taken advantage of no one. And he said, the team of men with me, guys like Titus and Timothy and Apollos. No, no, our team, we have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. And now, sometimes leaders need to stand up and say that because people have poisoned your minds. And you have to make a decision. See, every man seems right till another stands up to speak. And Paul said, all right, now I'm standing up and speaking. I know these things people have said about me, and I know these things people have said about Titus and our team. But he said, you know what? It's not true. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. Now he says, I do not say this to condemn you. He said, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to put you down. He said, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. 
Paul said, the purpose of me challenging you about your attitudes toward me is not to condemn you, but it's just to let you understand that you're loved, okay? This is his, his, goal, his purpose. He said, for I've said that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. He said, now listen, would you please make room in your hearts for us? He said, you, you know the truth. Now get the lies out of your head. He said, I'm not trying to condemn you. But he said, you know that you are in our hearts. He said, you know that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. He said, my purpose is to show love and commitment. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. He said, now listen, when we first came into Macedonia all those years ago, man, it was rough. On the outside, we fought, and on the inside, Paul said, you know, I had real fears I had to deal with. He even said to the church earlier, he said, I came to you with much fear and trembling. He said, now listen, you, you know our history. But God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he has, was comforted by you. For he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal, your zeal for me, and so that I rejoice still more. Titus came back and said, listen, Paul, the people love you. The people are sorry that you're not there. The people are zealous for you. The people want your leadership, Paul. He said, man, that makes me rejoice. That makes me rejoice. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. He said, I had to correct you, but I don't regret it. Though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. Now, now here's what I call the, the, the leadership conundrum. Sometimes we have to correct people, and we don't like it, and we don't enjoy it, and we wish we hadn't have done it. But we're glad we did it, because it helped them. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. So when I... When I challenged you, when I got in your face, when I was strong with you, you repented. For you felt a godly grief, not a worldly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. He said, there was, there was no loss. There was no spiritual loss because I, I confronted you. No, there was spiritual gain. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You know, when people produce worldly grief in you, it only produces separation. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you and what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in this matter. Paul said, you know, I confronted you. And you know what? Some of the things that I confronted you with weren't true. But he said, you know what? You cleared yourself. You were zealous. You didn't want to fight. You just wanted to clear yourself. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered wrong but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. All right, now notice, he's talking about, listen, I challenged you about this guy who was having sex with his stepmother. He said, I didn't write to you because of the one who did wrong. And I didn't write to you because of the one who suffered wrong. He said, but you needed to see that you were earnest, that you're, you were earnest for the leadership. And sometimes when pastors bring correction and people gather around the one corrected, you know what? Their hearts are in a bad place. Let me say that again. Their hearts are in a bad place. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, 
we rejoice still more with the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by all of you. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said about you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of all of you. He said, listen, as a leader, when, when he saw your obedience, how you received him with fear and trembling, you didn't lord it over him, you didn't put him down, you didn't despise his youth. He said, I rejoice. He said, I rejoice, why? Because I have complete confidence in you. This is what gives a pastor joy is the, the confidence that God's people will live right and do right in Jesus' name. All right, let's go quickly, for lack of time, let's go quickly to the book of Proverbs now. Proverbs chapter 12, beginning with verse 15. Let's read New Living Translation again. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Have you ever noticed that when the Apostle Paul got the revelation of the gospel, because he learned the revelation in the deserts of Arabia for three years being taught by Jesus. But then he, he, he came back to Jerusalem and he presented the gospel that he understood as coming from Jesus to the rest of the apostles. He said, unless I'd run my race in vain. He was a wise man. He was willing to listen to others. But a fool, a fool doesn't listen to anybody. God spoke to me. And they won't listen to anybody. That's called being a fool. A fool is quick-tempered. But a wise person stays calm when insulted. And you know what? Some of you, you like to get in little wars on Facebook. Would you just stop that? I mean, come on. You know, well, Pastor, I'm just having fun. No, you're not having fun. You you, you were quick-tempered. Now, it's, it's okay to be angry, but sin not. But it's not okay to be quick-tempered. A wise person stays calm when insulted. Now, now, brothers and sisters, all of us in life are going to get insulted. All of us in life are going to get insulted. Stay calm when you're insulted. Don't, don't, don't go off into a little Facebook rant. An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells a lie. So we have two types of witnesses. Two types of witnesses. An honest witness will tell the truth. A false witness will tell the lie. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Wow. Some people's words... Now look at a English Standard Version. There is one with rash words that are like sword thrusts. Man, they hurt. They, they cut. But the tongue of the wise, the words of the wise bring healing. What are your words? You know, are your words cutting? Do your words just bring pain to people? You know, do you do you feel that you know you're you're the judge over all and you have the right to just just rip people up and Ah, uh, we're called to tear down and destroy. Excuse me. The words of the wise bring healing. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. See, the nice thing about truth is truth endures. Lies do not endure. You know, Pastor, there are people that tell lies and people believe them generations later. But sooner or later, truth comes out. Truthful words stand the test of time. But lies are soon exposed. Learn to tell the truth. Truthful words last. Lies, they get exposed soon enough. You don't have to fight with them. All right, we'll close out today. I'll see you tonight, 7 o'clock.